Well, we're here to talk about Wallace Stevens' famous poem, 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird, and we've got Steve and Amaris and Max and Anna. Oh, man. And we've got Jason and Dave and Emily and Lily. So we've got 13 ways of looking at a blackbird. How would you, uh, Max, how would you, um, 13 ways of doing what? It's not just looking at a blackbird. What's he, why 13 ways? Why ways? Well, it's not so much ways of looking at a blackbird as it is ways of looking, I think. So it's... He, Are there many ways of looking? Sure, for sure, yeah. Um, especially in this poem, I think um, we get these, these 13 different scenes. Um, they're not, they don't seem to be linked by anything other than the blackbird. Emily, um, why, what, why, what is it about these poems, these early modernist poems... That where the poet is obsessed with or dwelling on ways of seeing. What is it about this new poetry that would be interested in multiple ways of seeing, as opposed to a more authoritarian way of seeing that we might that might characterize in earlier literature, where the author it has an authority, author authority, and there's one way of seeing, and that's what get delivered. But in this case, he decides to deliver thirteen ways. What is it? Can you generalize? Um. I think that obsession with different ways of looking is closely related to different ways of representing. And once you start changing and, in a sense, democratizing which forms are candidates for... Did you say democratizing? Did I say... Yeah, I did. Do you, see, do you <laughs> think that there's a, this change in epistemology, the foregrounding of the process of seeing, is has a democratic... What's the democratic part of it? Which perspectives are, are legitimate or authoritative... So, or Lily, this is saying, in implicitly this is saying, I don't privilege a single perspective. Well, it's saying that there isn't just one way of looking at a blackbird. There are 13 at least, the implication sort of being that there could be even more. So, Dave, why blackbirds, do you think? Why, why this uh, 13 ways of looking, of looking at a diamond ring, 13 ways of looking at uh, a barn? But well, no, a blackbird. Why blackbird? I think a lot of it is about contrast. And the great thing about blackbirds is... They're common, yet they have beautiful song. They're also black, and most black animals are seen as signs of bad luck, but blackbirds are actually seen as signs of good luck. So, I Dave, can you pick, and then I'll ask Anna to do the same, can you pick um, a section, one of the 13, in which contrast the blackness of the blackbird is visually or otherwise distinct? You can go right from the very first one, 20 snowy mountains, the only moving thing was the eye of the blackbird. You have a black eye, no pun intended, against a white backdrop of snowy mountains. You also have a contrast between... So you have the black eye of the bird in contrast with snowy mountains. You get a, a color contrast, but you get another kind of contrast, You get a right? contrast between 20, a lot of mountains, and a single blackbird. So, uh, Anna, what other kind of contrast is that? I'm, I'm sort of teasing out the obvious here, but... We've got a single eye of a blackbird, and we've got 20 mountains. So what is the other contrast there? Well, uh, I mean, it's numerical, right? It's one thing that you kind of fixate on out of many. Um, it's super visual, too. I mean, the colors, really is. The colors are just, like, it's black and white. Hey, 20 if you had mountains. one of these groovy new digital cameras, uh, at least, or maybe groovy old digital camera like the one I have, but... There's a little symbol when you line up to take a picture of the tw 20 snowy mountains. It says, landscape? Are you doing a landscape? <laughs> right? And what does the camera do to adjust itself for the landscape? Anybody know? I mean, what's the point of the camera un trying to understand itself digitally it, that it's a landscape? It doesn't pick a focus in the foreground. Right. It, it won't focus anything in the yeah. foreground. It's yeah. got, it basically says, oh, you want a long, long view. So... The eye, let's just figure this out, Jason, visually. The, mm -hmm. the blackbird, how could you see an eye of a bird, a tiny bird and then a tinier part of a bird among snowy mountains? Where must it be situated in order to be seen like this? Well, it would be situated close, close enough <coughs> that we could see the eye. Right. Um, as well, there's the middle line, 
where we have the only moving thing was the eye of the blackbird. And so 20 snowy mountains, no matter how majestic, are not, we might say that they are moving or sublime, but... Moving in the sense of they move us, they make us right. respond emotionally. Right, and yet <clears throat> I think that there's a double use of the, of the word there where the only thing that moves us is the eye of the blackbird. So we may walk among 20... I mean, it, it may be a static landscape, but it may be that the only thing among all of these things that we come across that moves us is the living eye of the blackbird. The yeah, seeing and of eye. course, it's the seeing eye. It's the yeah. thing that's looking back. So we're looking and we're looking look back at, if that's the way to put it, so, Max, just to stay with number one for a second, um, what is this thing about when everything, when you've got a big panorama and there's only one thing moving, why is it that we focus on that? Well, we're tra- I think we're trained to see, to see movement. I mean, we're trained to see things in, in, in flux, to see, to see dynamic bodies. Yeah. Okay, so, um, Lily, pick another one of the 13 that fo- that's, uh, that helps us with contrast, that focuses on contrast. Because con- another way of saying contrast is juxtaposition. So before you pick another one, I'll put you on the spot. What, what is it about juxtaposition that is imagistic? Because we've been talking about imagist poems where you get juxtapositions. In the wheelbarrow poem, which we'll get to a, you know, at a certain point, we have the red wheelbarrow and the white chicken. So that's color juxtaposition. You've got inanimate and animate. Tell us about juxtaposition. Well, juxtapositions are cool because it lets the objects kind of define each other by the contrast that they provide to your yeah, eye when nice. you look at them. So yeah. the edges are less likely to be blurred, I guess, when you have something that's really obviously different from the thing that's next to it. Good. So pick, pick one for contrast. Um, Any one at all. Okay. Um, I guess another one for color contrast is icicles filled the long window with barbaric glass so that's number six yeah. shall i read it sure okay six icicles filled the long window with barbaric glass the shadow of the blackbird crossed it to and fro the mood traced in the shadow an indecipherable cause so i want you to comment on this and i'll ask steve to do the same you get a minute to think about it, Steve. Go ahead, Lily. Well, there's a, there are a couple of interesting contrasts in that stanza. There's um, the difference between icicles, sort of like nature's glass, and windows, which would be like more domestic glass. Mm-hmm. Um, and the icicles are barbaric, and you can picture them as barbaric because they're pointy and jagged, as opposed to the window of your house, which is a very smooth pane that you wouldn't otherwise have thought. Um then they get crossed, meaning um, filled, I think of, hmm. um, by the shadow of the blackbird, which is an obvious like color contrast and also a textural contrast because it's not see-through as the glass and the icicle are. So, Steve, uh, six, number six is a fairly complicated, if it's imagistic, it's complicated. Number one is very imagistic. It's only three lines. It's haiku-like. It's got a certain mystery about it, but it's also very visual. But six is not quite that. What would you? What do you do with six? Does it belong with the others, or is it rhetorically different? Uh, I think it fits with the others, uh, and part of it is that, that sort of contrast. We have icicles, these you know beautiful textured three dimensional objects crossed by a, a flat, blurry shadow. I mean, there's the, it, the shadow almost pulls you out of the the uh, the, the, the beauty of your three D perception, um, and draws out a yeah cl- classic and just kind of. Uh, Contrast, and part of that contrast is, is that you're forced to, to uh, work with these two different images, um, like the beauty of innuendos. Uh, you're forced to, re- to, uh, mm. to uh, yeah. To when we that. see a phrase like barbaric glass, it almost points forward in our course to Stein, who in Tender Buttons would use a fr- phrase like that. Okay, Amaris, I'm going to read a few of these shorter sections, and I'm going to stipulate that they're funny, that the blackbird's appearance is funny. Now, I'd be, I could be wrong. But you, you're you're the kind of person who appreciates funny things. I think. <laughs> Isn't that true? You have I, a really I hope good. I appreciate. You have a really <laughs> good sense of humor. So I'm going to read it 
you know, I'm going to emphasize what I consider to be the comic appearance of the blackbird. He's kind of like Zelig. He's ubiquitous. He's, he seems to show up in every scene. And that, I might be wrong, but I'd love for you to comment on that. And then Max, who's smiling very much, can say a little more. Okay. Um, I was of three minds, like a tree, in which there are three blackbirds. That's number two. Three. The blackbird whirled in the autumn wind. It was a small part of the pantomime. Four. A man and a woman are one. A man, a woman, and a blackbird are one. <laughs> I guess I did a good job on that to make it funny. Number nine. When the blackbird flew out of sight, it marked the edge of one of many circles. That's actually not funny. That's quite amazing. You know? that funny. <laughs> um, that's really not funny, but it's great. Uh, Twelve. The river is moving. The blackbird must be flying. Okay. Is it funny? Where, wh why does this blackbird keep showing up? Is it, it's, he's sort of like a bad penny. You know that idiom? <laughs> yes. Um, well, I would agree with the first three. Um, in that he makes an obvious move away from what would, we would logically conclude. Um, it, particularly with the numbers, there is a lack of equality, but as Lily was saying about the juxtaposition of things, what we discover in the difference is the imagination, imaginative quality that Stevens is trying to bring to the poem. So we talked about the first stanza being very imagistic and um, not literal, but um, sort of tied to that image of the geography of the landscape and the blackbird in the foreground. Um, but here we seem to be moving more towards that world of the mind that Stevens is more concerned with and has more Are you saying that the blackbird might stand in for the imagination? I think he's definitely trying to have a, there's a symbolic progression. Wow. What a, usually the imagination is um, an eagle... Uh, what's the poetry magazine has Pegasus you know this is a blackbird so this is another I if it's the imagination Max it's another inversion of traditional notions of high poetry because the blackbird yes. is this common thing anyway do you want to speak to that or the comedy stuff uh, <clears throat> I'll speak to both <laughs> okay um, I think yeah I think the funniest of the, of the, of the few that you read was number four a man and a woman are one, a man and a woman and a blackbird Which suggests that the, the blackbird one. is romantically or sexually yes. a, third, a third wheel, I think. He's just the phrase, he's like right? there Do behind them. we say a them. third wheel? Like he's watching. Yeah, he's precisely this, yeah, he's this watching. This is an X-rated Mod Po recording. <laughs> but I think sections... The, the blackbird is watching. Anna, are you okay? <laughs> I'm good. I, I think sections... It's funny. <laughs> It is funny, right? It's totally so, funny. I'm sorry, Max. We'll go oh, back no, no, no. to you. Oh, yeah, we'll yeah, go yeah, back no, to you, I promise. Anna, funny. what's funny about it? I'm sorry, Max. Um, no, 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 no. I what's mean, funny about it? It's just there. Every time you... <laughs> the, 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 can I say and then <laughs> you can... Go ahead. So, the, just when you're about to forget the damn blackbird, he shows up again. Yeah. <laughs> 13 different ways. We can't do this without the blackbird. He's the common denominator. Okay, go ahead. I mean, say whatever you I want. I don't know how I totally feel about this yet, but I think... I mean, we sort of talked about this in the beginning about it having maybe some images qualities, especially in this the first section we talked about. But I think in those sections where it's funny, he may be poking fun at imagism a little bit. Because when you read it, it still has the same kind of... I mean, except you read it, you know, playing up the funniness of it. But it, when you read through the poem just on your own, the whole piece kind of has this sort of gravity to it from the language, from the short stanzas, from... I don't know, I just kind of imagine Stevens reading it, and he was kind of like, I just imagine him as a kind of Having a grave Having fun. Reader. Yeah. yeah. So that we haven't used the word cubist, right? We haven't used the word cubist. Um, but this is clearly cubism, right? So this is an attempt to render multi-perspectively um, a view that could be rendered as one, but is rendered as many, 13. I'm not sure the significance of the number. Is it bad luck or whatever? Um, who wants to, s Steve, you seem like the kind of guy who would, I don't mean to give, uh, to ask you to give a dictionary definition of cubism. I wouldn't dare <laughs> force you to do that. But what is cubism in the context of this poem? Right. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, briefly, classically, uh, cubist painters use the, uh, the 
yeah, yeah, the strategy of incorporating multiple uh, views of a single object into a single image. And, uh, th- and th- there is that element. There's also a kind of trying again and again and again. Yes. Uh, a kind yes. of, uh, you can see the craft. And so, uh, it, 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 again, a little anticipates Gertrude Stein for us in the sense that Stein will often, and uh, William Carlos Williams in Portrait of a Lady, who tries to do it and then gets called up short, tries again and tries again. And instead of deleting all that, he leaves all that, those tries. Right, indeed, precisely. Yeah. Okay, so I want to talk briefly about Section 13. And then, simply because we're running out of time, but we could talk about this forever, I'll just go around and ask you each to just say one more thing about this poem that you wouldn't want people studying it for the first time to miss. So let's, I'll read 13, we'll talk about it, and then we'll, we'll go around the horn. Um, 13, this is my favorite, and it's not funny, I don't think. It was evening all afternoon. It was snowing, and it was going to snow. The blackbird sat in the cedar limbs. So Anna's holding her heart. Oh. That's beautiful. Why? <laughs> Why is it beautiful? It's contradictory. It's paradoxical. Well, I think uh, if, if you've ever lived in a snowy place or a place that sees snow, you can totally relate to that. It was evening all afternoon. That kind of like... A storm. On a snowy day, it gets yeah. like dark at 3 o'clock. Yes, yeah, very good. And yeah. it's just kind of dark all afternoon, and all you want to do is just... What about like, it was snowing and it was going to snow? That's a paradox. But maybe not, Dave? I like how it plays with the linearity of, of time a little bit. It, it, it's in the present, but it somehow knows the future. And in a sense, it takes the blackbird, and he's perched, sitting there, looking beyond time. Emily, the blackbird is finally static in this. Been da- he's, he's really had a, a long day, 13 different <laughs> scenes. Like I can see Stephen saying, Blackbird, come in. I want you to go there. Move, d- please dart through this scene. No, no, let's take two. Let's do it again. You know, he's sort of this blackbird's been through his paces, and now finally he's just hunkered down. Um, do you have anything to say about the stillness of the blackbird at the end? Is that appropriate, Emily? I do. It's, so there's something almost, if we're going to go with the humorous theme, there's something a little bit smug about this little creep of a blackbird just like sort of perched on. Did you call him a creep? Lungs. Yeah, he's a little <laughs> bit of a creep. He's a little bit of a and, creep. Um, he's in the way. Yeah. He's in our faces. Especially to the man and the woman. And there's something so almost banal about this blackbird just doing a sort of ordinary and, and uncomplicated thing like sitting in this tree in the midst of all these sort of paradoxes and contradictions. Thank you. I'd also say that there's a there's a reversal of the uh, and think about William Carlos Williams' poem "Lines," which reverses the natural and the artificial. All right, so we commonly think of the natural as bright, and in that poem, Williams reverses it. Um, in this poem, we begin with section one, where the biggest landscape, the twenty snowy mountains, are still, but the thing that moves is the blackbird. In the end. The na- nature is moving, it's snowing, it's, things are happening, um, and it's the blackbird that's still. So there's, there's, there's a reversal, there's a foregrounding, and a, what's the opposite of foregrounding? Backgrounding. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go around, we'll start with Amaris and go all the way around to Steve. Say one thing briefly about this poem that you wouldn't want people to miss that hasn't been said. And it may simply be, you know, something about your favorite stanza. So, Amaris? I mean, it's nice that we just came around to that because I was just reflecting on the connection between this, the moving image in the first stanza and the static image at the end. And if we go back to what I was talking about, um, the symbolic progression throughout the poem, then it seems that we've started at the natural image and moved to the mental or imaginary image at the end. But there's a certain sadness to the fact that it's um, static, and it brings me to stanza nine, which we, I think we all found very beautiful, which is when the blackbird flew out of sight and marked the edge of one of many circles, and there seems to be this need to circle between the imagination and the reality that's in front of us. I'm so um, glad you mentioned that section, because that's the one section where the blackbird actually is imagined as not yeah, there. Exactly. Yeah, that's terrific. Max, a, f- a final thought on this real quick? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment on, on what Amri said about the symbolic progression, and I think that's such a... And also what we said earlier about how the blackbird stands in for the imagination, because I think the, the symbolic progression here of the blackbird is such a lovely way of thinking about the imagination. He sort of starts as this 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 empty signifier that's just calling our attention to something, or, or you know, three 
three blackbirds equals three minds or something. But eventually he takes on this this character. He's voyeuristic. He's sort of he's sort of sexual and <clears throat> um, I also though wanted to call attention to sections seven and eight, two sections that we didn't talk about, which to for me sort of form the the meta poetic center of this poem. Well, in the interest of time, I'll read eight and you can comment on that. Of course, okay. Yeah. I know noble accents and lucid, inescapable rhythms. But I know, too, that the blackbird is involved in what I know. That's, well, that's really great. The blackbird is the very thing that's, that's stopping him, or at least making him self-conscious about writing, say, in the inescapable rhythm of, of pentameter, or, or more formally or metrically. Once again, proving that it's much better to close read these poems with a lot of people, because I would not have thought to say that, Max. Nice job. Anna, quickly, final word. Well, I'm going to go ahead and piggyback. Um, I think the I think eight um, saying that I know noble accents and lucid, inescapable rhythms. I think he's kind of getting at the sort of tradition of poetry, the traditional poetic canon that um, here he's kind of getting away from. It's like I'm not writing a sonnet about a blackbird. I'm not even writing thirteen sonnets about a blackbird. Um, I'm not using the noble accents. And which makes me think of like I know them. I'm capable of them, them. But but I know that. too. Ah, it's an interesting alternative. Very much like Picasso's progression as a painter too, right? Starting with depiction and ending up with well, not ending up, but moving toward cubism. Definitely. Good point, Jason. Let's see. I wanted to um, just look at eleven, where <laughs> he rode over Connecticut in a glass coach. Once a fear pierced him, and that he mistook the shadow of his equipage. Equipage. equipage so that's the um, his carriage, that's the carriage, carriage equipment, right. yeah. the vehicle. He, he mistook the shadow of of his equipage for blackbirds. So I mean, it is not the man who mistook his wife for a hat, but it is. <laughs> um, there is the sense that this shadow is more than a shadow it isn't blackbirds but but that is a mistake so um the way in which the blackbirds i mean as i as i look at the whole poem i want to see every v in the roman numerals or i mean as as i move through i want to see every, every letter as a as a blackbird. blackbird. <laughs> that was great. Can I add a, an extra reading to that? That's terrific. Um, that's a famous section, silly in a way. Yeah. But what's happening there, if I can be really mundane about it, is we've got you know, the poet or you know, s- some poet figure driving, probably not in a glass coach, but driving across Connecticut in this somewhat blank landscape. And looking... To the side of the car, you see the car's shadow moving along. You know how it kind of ripples along the side. And if you go up, there's a bank, and the the shadow will kind of move. Mm -hmm. And in a way, what he does is he imagines that the blackbird is kind of following him along and that he's not casting a shadow from the car, but that the blackbird is accompanying him. And that's how we get the blackbird in this final 11th hour appearance in that one. The blackbird is not there, but it's in a way following him along. It's sort of like an alter ego, shadow of the man, secret sharer, as Conrad would put it. So it's pretty spooky and cool. And I love the idea that there are blackbirds all over this poem. All right, Dave, real quick, final word. In that stanza, I think it's also interesting that it's a glass coach. And the, the previous time we saw glass in a poem, it was barbaric glass. So I think there he sets up another fun, a fun dichotomy. Yeah, great. Okay. Emily, we're going to skip you and give you the final, final word, because that's <laughs> just what you do. Uh, Lily? Um, well, thinking back to what you said about the first stanza and the last stanza as, like, companions that are almost, almost undo or um, do the opposite thing of each other, I think that 3 and 11 are, um, are similar in that, in three, um, it's the blackbird world in the autumn winds. It was a small part of the pantomime. And then um, in 12, the river is moving. The blackbird must be flying. And you had highlighted that as a funny stanza. But I actually think that the two make a lot of sense together because, to me, the pantomime aspect is like looking at something out a window when everything is really silent. So you can't necessarily hear the river moving or the wind blowing, but you just 
can see the blackbird moving and it's mm-hmm. a small part but it's still the part you're focusing on but in the same way that we start with focusing on the blackbird in stanza one or in the first part and then end by focusing on nature in the last stanza i think the same thing with three and twelve where in three you're focusing on the blackbirds whirling but in 12 you only think of the blackbird once you see the river moving when you look outside great thank you lily steve uh, i'll just note quickly that this is a great example of a real object lesson in picking the right form for uh, for your content if you write one twee haiku like poem about a blackbird <laughs> it may not be that memorable but but this they, did you say twee <laughs> certainly i did, did say twee some of these are more twee than it's others, almost but. the blackbird is almost <laughs> capable of saying twee himself <laughs> isn't it Oh, that's so true. Well, anyway. <laughs> uh, well, there you go. And, and, but in this structure, it's become, um, you know, a monumental classic. It really has. And, and imitated yeah. a million times. He, he had, Wallace Stevens had the right instinct not to do the pure images thing of a haiku. You know, it's really, this is not a station of the metro. Mm-hmm. In that instance, what Pound does is he takes a nexus of experiences that are, are overwhelming him, and then through the process of revision, he renders it down to the littlest thing the most condensed thing, and that's imagism more classic. In this case, Stevens allows 13 different ways to stand. They're very different, although each element is imagistic to some degree. Overall, it's really doing something other than imagism. It's doing cubism. Emily, you get the final word. I'm sure, sure. There's, you'll have something brilliant to well, say. Well, that's, that's no pressure at all. <laughs> <laughs> As usual. <laughs> yeah. um, we said that we could call this poem 13 Ways of Looking rather than just 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird. But I think we could also say that it's 13 Ways of Being because um, one of the most charming and maybe optimistic things about this poem's argument is it seems to be suggesting that by apprehending something beautiful that we can sort of demolish the boundaries of individual subjectivity because we see not just the bird changing and becoming more dynamic and sort of shifting contextually, but the speaker of the poem changes to the point where, to some extent, well, we never really know who he is to begin with, but he becomes increasingly less recognizable. And in half of these sections, he's not even present. The eye isn't even present. And when it is, it's not really an eye as we can understand it. It's an eye which is sort of divided into the sort of triadic structure or an eye which is also a man and a woman and a blackbird. And the idea that by sort of engaging with something beautiful, by sort of pursuing some type of aesthetic pleasure that we can remove those boundaries between ourselves and others is sort of charming and and lovely. Charming, to say the least. Thank you, Emily. Does anybody have anything, any way of responding to Emily's brilliant final word? I do. (laughs) That was great. I think a phrase for what you're describing might be radical subjectivity. This is post-romantic. This is not just romantic that is in, as in romanticism subjectivity. This is, this is modernist subjectivity. So, well, this is, this is a wonderful poem. I've, I've, this has been fun talking about it because I realize how much I like this poem and Wallace Stevens. Thank you very much.